Hello and welcome to everyone, uh, to all panelists and participants from different parts of the world. Um, I'm Elham Bahman Timri. I'm a lecturer in planning at the University of Auckland. Uh, I'm the co-founder and co-director of uh, History and Theory Hub at the University of Auckland. Uh, we are running this uh, mini conference based on uh, the support that we receive uh, from the Faculty of Creative Arts and Industry uh, at the University of Auckland and also from the HT Hub. And uh, uh, I would like to say first, thank you very much to all our panelists. Um, thank you for your uh, contribution and for attending in this mini conference in memory of Associate Professor Michael Bonder. Um, the topic of our discussion today is uh, ideological fantasies in planning practices. First, I think we have Dr. Liberty here. He is the head of the School of Architecture and Planning. He wants to help us um, at the beginning of the conference with some memories of, um, from Michael Gondor. Please, Dr. Liberty, the floor is yours. Thanks, Thanks very much, Ali. And Good, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. It's um, evening in the afternoon here in Auckland, New Zealand, where I am. Uh, so on behalf of the school where Michael taught, and I'll talk a bit about Michael, um, I'm the head of the school and director of urban design here at the University of Auckland School of Architecture. Great to have you here. And it's great to have you here to celebrate Michael's um, life. And, and I'd just like to thank Ali and Mosin and all of you for organizing such an awesome event to celebrate quite a esteemed colleague. And I'll just start off with some quick, quick things. I've actually known Michael for a long period of time. Um, and before Michael was an academic, he was like myself. I'm actually really a practitioner. Uh, we actually worked in practice together at a council in, in Auckland here, North Shore City Council. And I remember my boss at the time, it was this crazy Welsh dude, he was a lovely man, Mr. Mr. Hughes, said, I've just employed this crazy Canadian guy with some really interesting ideas to think about planning approaches that we could deal with here in the city. And he came into the policy team because I was working in consents or you know, in permits at the time. And he came up with some really interesting ideas, I have to admit, and he, some of the ideas were a vehicle trip control to deal with retail, which was the bane of my life and many of my colleagues' life when I became the manager for many years to come. But it showed that Michael was prepared to engage in both practice and obviously into the academic world. And then he left North Shore City and after a long distinguished career, obviously before that in Canada and, the, and in the UK, we did very, very well and the types of things. Then he came to the University of Auckland and he studied under Tom Fuchs, who was actually my supervisor as well for my doctorate. And he was thick as thieves with him and Bruce Hucker. They worked very well. He worked out very well through, the, through that process became head of school for a period of time. And then unfortunately due to health reasons, he um, stepped down from that role and then just contributed on his academic career, which as you guys are gonna comment on far more than I am. I'd just like to just talk about two things that sort of brought home Michael's thing to me the most. I'll never forget when I was um, sitting in front of a photocopier once and we were talking and he was, I was looking at the lecture notes that were coming out of the photocopier, he was about to give a lecture. And I actually said to Michael, I said, oh, the law has actually changed now. That problem's sort of been addressed that he was talking about. And he said, oh, well, it's all about the fantasies of delusions of practitioners. Don't worry about it. It's all about the story. And I'll never forget him talking about those types of things. And he'd always lament about the problems in practice and such like. So as I said, he's had a long, distinguished career. And also with his practice career, that came a role in the New Zealand Planning Institute. And I remember he was president of that for, for a great period of time and, and served the Auckland region on that institute and actually became a fellow. And to become a fellow for the New Zealand Planning Institute is actually a really big thing. We only actually have 12 fellows out of the hundreds and th well, thousands of members that we've had over time. So it's actually a really, really honorable thing that he's just achieved. So I look back as a colleague and a friend um, for all those years, going back nearly 30 years, and I'll leave it to you to talk more about the sort of things you do on the academic side, but as you guys know, but again, I'd just like to thank you on behalf of the school and the university for making your time and to celebrate Michael's life. So thanks very much, Ali, for the opportunity to, to open the conference and I hope it goes well. And I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Lee. Thank you very much. I know uh, it was really difficult for you. You are very busy and I really appreciate your time. Um, and, um, for attending yeah, for today uh, mini conference. Thank you very much, Lee. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, yes, today we are here, we gather to uh, acknowledge and appreciate um, Michael great contribution to our discipline. Um, just, just one point that I need to uh, mention is that we have eight uh, presentations today. And then we will open up the floor for the Q&A at the end after all presentations. Um, please audience, um, I would like to ask our audience to type your questions in the Q&A space uh, after um, the, the presentations and mention the name of the panelists that you would like to ask your questions. Uh, now, uh, I would like to uh, ask our uh, first uh, speaker, um, um, uh, uh, Emeritus Professor Jean Hillier, um, the Emeritus Professor of Sustainability and Urban Planning in the Center, of, Center for Urban Research, RMIT University, uh, to um, um, start your presentations. Um, all, your, all is yours. Jean. Thank you, Ellie. I'll attempt to share the screen. Okay, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wajak Noongar people on whose unceded land I live and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And thanks very much indeed to Ellie and to Mosin in particular for organising this, this tribute to Michael with whom I, I worked for about 13 years, I suppose, on and off. Okay. Nature-based solutions as ideological fantasy. Try and do it in about 11 minutes. In 2009, Michael Gunder and I wrote about sustainability as an empty signifier and ideological fantasy, which served to sustain capital accumulation and economic growth, often at the expense of non-human nature. We argued that the term sustainability is fantastic or phantasmatic in the Lacanian sense, masking the fact that business as usual tends to continue sustaining not nature, but social and environmental injustices. This fantasy has expanded in the last decade with the burgeoning of greenwash terms in planning, particularly ecosystem services, green infrastructure, enviro development, and so on, several of which have been incorporated into the relatively new idiom of nature-based solutions, of which I think we're gonna hear a lot coming out of COP. NBS serves as a catch-all term for diverse human actions that deploy, enhance, or conserve nature to deliver one or more desired ecosystem services. This indicates not only the catch-all essence of empty signifiers, but also the anthropocentric, economic-driven identity of ecosystem services as nature in the service of humans. In this paper, I explored discourses of NBS as illusionary ideological fantasy, purported to offer a win-win for everyone in order to unmask the powerful relationalities reinforced through its proliferation and implementation in spatial planning. I outline the importance of discourse and signifiers. I explain how engagement with the norms of a practice are ideologically governed by the logic of fantasy, illustrate how the ideological fantasy of NBS has come to grip and exert its powerful hold over us at the expense of social and environmental justice and conclude that there's a need to recognize nature-based solutions for the ideological fantasy they are, and to generate practices of spatial planning which traverse this fantasy and begin to confront the real socio-economic environmental questions of our time. Griggs et al. introduced the notion of ideological discourse as a system of representation comprising signifiers of words and images, which conceals contingency and naturalizes relations of domination. The definition they use is on the PowerPoint. Ideological discourse often contains empty signifiers, which partially fix the meaning of different identities and demands, like in NBS, non-human nature, environmental protection, economic development, and so on. And again, the definition's there. I argue that different needs and demands of vulnerable communities and non-human nature in particular are concealed by the empty signifier of NBS. The notion of ideological fantasy represents an encounter between Laclau's political logic of ideology and Lacan's ideas of fantasy and desire. Phantasmatic logics represent the forces in play behind solidifying and protecting meanings and associated vested interests, or facilitating fluidity of meaning 
through the promise of fullness of a political project or ideology. MBS offer imaginations of better futures. The idea of a solution offers a vision of how the future might look and how to attain it. But nothing is ever closed or complete. There's always a lack or gap between what's achieved and what's desired. Yet we don't recognize this. And so we retain the ideological illusion of fullness or completeness, often by concealing or making invisible what's inconvenient. The term MBS was introduced by the World Bank in 2008 and the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, 2009. In 2014, the IUCN gave the definition that I've got on the top left. The origins of NBN, MBS in an organization like the World Bank and this IUCN definition demonstrate the terms anthropocentric economic driven foundations. By 2021, the IUCN had actually included biodiversity benefits in its definition, which as you can see from the lower second part of the page, nevertheless remains suddenly anthropocentric. And you can see the logo that they use on the right hand side, it's all about societal challenges. There's very little about nature. MBS brought together existing discourses and initiatives, including ecosystem services, green infrastructure, and all the ones again I've listed on there. However, it theoretically goes beyond such discourses as it refocuses the debate on humans and spe specifically integrates societal factors, including human well being and poverty reduction, socioeconomic development, and governance principles. On the right hand side, you've got Raymond et al.'s 2017 diagram, and they show all the relations between these, these issues. But as you can see, there's a big blank by ecosystems, which worries me. In 2020, the IUCN produced a global standard for nature based solutions. The introduction is indicative of how the IUCN actually perceives nature, and I quote, it's the sustainable development of natural capital, that is the world's stocks of natural assets, which include geology, soil, air, water, and all living things. There have been literally thousands of different NBS implemented internationally in the last five years or so. Seddon et al's 2021 survey demonstrates that investments and policy support are directed predominantly towards created rather than restored or conserved ecosystems and tree plantations in particular. Other common initiatives include green walls and roofs, urban parks, water sensitive design, coastal works and so on. Many planning related organizations in Australia appear to equate MBS to the building with nature concept of green star ratings for buildings. So MBS don't challenge or descend the processes of urbanization per se, but potentially merely dress them in various shades of blue or green. Various existing initiatives, such as planting street trees, painting cycle lanes, can be rebadged or rebranded with the new MBS buzzword. So MBS offers cities optimal ecosystem services provision, as Croiser et al say. Optimal, suggesting the ideological fantasy of fulfillment and ecosystem services regarding benefits in the service of humans rather than nature. And this point is exemplified by Egamont et al's typology, which I've got there. In this diagram, nature is regarded as a service to humans who better use ecosystems in type one solutions, such as in fisheries. Type two solutions include managed ecosystems, agricultural landscapes, and type three include the design and management of new ecosystems, such as greening buildings and artificial ecosystems. I ask where are the demands and needs of nature in this anthropocentric utilitarianism? All the diagrams I've shown depict the articulatory nature of the discourse of NBS. They bind contingent elements together into relational systems dominated by economic, social and political elements. As a result of diagrammatic representation, identities of non-humans are modified into nature as a commodity to be used for the benefit of humans. The culture, nature, human, non-human binary is perpetuated, elevating humans above non-human nature. The ideological promise of fullness for humans obtained from human nature interaction completely ignores not only less productive interactions, zoonotic disease vectors for humans, hunting for non-humans, but importantly, 
the more than human nature centered rather than nature based worldviews of First Nation people. There appears to be little evidence of environmental justice to nature. In the seminal volume edited by K. B. Shital in 2017, animals are mentioned only twice, once with respect to habitat and once with regard to negative health effects for humans associated with animal feces on green spaces. In terms of justice to humans, not everyone benefits equally from MBS. Urban green space projects, for instance, wow, okay, <laughs> tend to be disproportionately concentrated in middle and upper income areas, while upgrading of urban parks may displace vulnerable people such as the homeless or low income renters from a newly attractive neighborhood where rents increase. There's very little influence or consideration of First Nation Indigenous knowledges. OK, I'll have to move on very rapidly. So what this PowerPoint saying is that we tend to see nature based solutions as nature plus economy plus development with the emphasis on economy and development. It seemed, it seemed to be one of the first class tickets where benefits are maximized for everyone while leaving the neoliberal capitalist system intact. So what can be done, and I haven't got time to go into this, but hopefully it's in a, in a longer paper. So ra basically, rather than nature-based initiatives, I'm arguing for centering nature in initiatives where the ecosystem becomes a frame and a basis for decision-making. In conclusion then, there will never be completeness. There can never be a solution as such. We rely on ideological fantasies to safeguard our desires. Perhaps we should be having fantasies of nature-centered practices instead of nature-based solutions. And I end with the very last words which Michael and I wrote together, a comment on solutions taken from Savoy Zizek. Our painful progress of knowledge, our confusions, our search for solutions, that is to say, precisely that which seems to separate us from the way reality is out there, is already the innermost constituent of reality itself. The fact that we cannot ever fully know reality is thus not a sign of our limitation of knowledge, but the sign that reality itself is incomplete, open, a naturalization of the underlying virtual process of becoming. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, thanks for um, interesting um, presentation. I would like to ask our next speaker, um, Tanya, uh, Winkler, uh, prof uh, Associate Professor Tanya Winkler, Winkler from the University of Cape Town uh, from South Africa. Um, uh, the floor is yours, Tanya, please. Thank you very much, Eli. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, everyone. Um, every technical problem that could have <laughs> beset me today has done so and for some peculiar reason I'm not able to um, start my video so unfortunately you're, you're going to have to um, listen to my voice I, I, I'll try and change the tone all right so so thank you again Ellie and 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 hello and hi everyone um I'm going to read <laughs> I can't use lovely props and images so my apologies all right, in a number of thought-provoking articles published by Michael Gunder over the years, he argues that fantasies are essential to planning actions, since without an explicit awareness or an acknowledgement of fantasy, the workings of planning organizations, their institutional culture and ideologies cannot be fully understood. Thus, for Michael, Fantasies are not mere pie-in-the-sky imaginaries that are easily dismissible as nonsensical entities. Rather, fantasies resemble our innermost desires for a supreme good that may resolve our problems, that may fulfill our wants and needs, and that may free us from our own anxieties and insecurities. So if I confess to you all now, I wish my innermost desires not to have technical problems and to be freed from my insecurity of these. <laughs> but anyway, let me, let me remain focused. So this, as we already know, is a Lacanian understanding of fantasy that presumably resides in all of us, whether we are conscious of this or not. It provides us with some sense of security or <laughs> okayness, 
For without these fantasies, we simply would not be able to survive in a world that is, in reality, filled with horror, violence, fear, injustices, and uncertainties. However, and importantly, these types of survival fantasies reside not only in the individual, but they have also found their way into the public domain via policy directives, strategic frameworks, and design guidelines. Even if planners are acutely aware of the fact that their fantasized outcomes cannot possibly be achieved. Said different, uh, my apologies, said differently, these are our vision statements and expressed mandates that appease our innermost desire of creating future cities and regions of stability, certainty, and harmony. And as more and more individuals become invested in their organization's fantasies, the less likely they are to challenge these. In fact, in order to show some resemblance of solidarity with our employer, we often go along with impossible fantasies, even if our gut is telling us something else. Yet, as Michael um, astutely observed, it is precisely this tendency to hold on to unattainable fantasies that negates possibilities to explore alternative perspectives. In response, Michael suggests that we ought to acquire a different relationship to fantasy, namely one that acknowledges its existence in the first place, but one that also prompts us to no longer be beholden to impossible desires. To be sure, Michael is calling for a more ethical use of fantasy. But this use of fantasy necessitates an ethics of taking risks and making radical decisions. In fact, such an ethics demands a revolutionary act that risks everything, including our own status, and everything we may already presume to know. I, in turn, interpret this revolutionary act as an unlearning of taken for granted ways of knowing and doing um, planning in the global south. Yet, <laughs> and this feels a little bit like a confessional, while my innermost desire might yearn for an unlearning of everything that I already presume to know, in truth, the philosophical lenses and research methods that I use to collect, analyze, synthesize, and interpret my own research findings tend to remain rooted in Western systems of thought. With this statement, I'm not suggesting that there is anything wrong with the use of ever-evolving Western philosophies or research methods. Rather, my aim here is simply to draw our attention to the fact that while I and other self-identified Southern planning scholars might hope to unlearn taken for granted ways of knowing, Western thinking is extremely effective in seeding a unidimensional understanding of scientific rigor to which most of us are tethered. As a result, our privileged education, whether obtained in the global North or the global South, effectively socializes us as Western thinkers, while dismissing anything that does not make sense in accordance to these established norms. Thus, if we are serious about embracing a different relationship to established norms and established fantasy, perhaps it might be to adopt Jean Hillier's strategic navigation approach that begins by asking, what might happen if? So <laughs> let's be bold and let's ask, for example, what might happen if we heeded Walter Mignolo's long-standing call for an epistemic delinking from Western categories of thought? Or what might happen if we disrupted foregone conclusions about planning practice by resisting dominant narratives and by celebrating epistemic disobedience in their stead? Or what might happen if we desisted from engaging in a war of words 
that has become common practice in Western modes of scholarship. And if instead we affirmed pluriversal as opposed to universal ways of knowing. Or what might happen if we adopted a relational approach to land as opposed to doggedly adhering to the fantasy of absolute land ownership and exchange value. And finally, as Michael and I ask in an article that was published posthumously, what might happen if we embraced an ethics of care and inclusion that acknowledges all objects as valuable and not only the human? In the aforementioned article, Michael and I demonstrate how conventional planning ethics privilege the human over all other objects and entities, thereby entrenching the fantasy of vertical ontologies alone. In response, we explore how a meta-ethical lens might contribute to a flat ontological perspective. And while there isn't sufficient time in today's session to elaborate on our argument, it is worth noting that flat ontological perspectives are primarily concerned with ontological questions of being instead of epistemological questions of knowing. And that in a flat ontological perspective, humans are simply another kind of object and that all objects exist equally. By way of this, an example, just to share with you one example that, that we identified, we spotlight how some river systems in New, in New Zealand have been awarded the same legal rights as humans. To conclude, what might happen if questions accommodate the transgressive dimension of ideological fantasies in planning practice? They encompass revolutionary acts regardless of costs to self, and they allow us to move beyond established fantasies while recasting planning in new and creative ways. Before I end, I would like to, like Jean, thank Ellie, Musan, Nicholas, and all the um, organizers and facilitators of this important and beautiful conference in memory and in, in, um, in celebration of Michael's important work. I would also like to thank all the speakers, um, and all the participants, I look, we, I look forward to, to the conversations, to the, the questions later. And above all else, I would like to thank Michael for the ongoing learning sharing opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya, uh, for your uh, interesting talk, um, despite the, the technical difficulty that you had. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the next speaker is uh, Professor Angelique uh, Chetipambil Rojan uh, from the University of Reading uh, from the UK. Uh, please, Angelique, um, take the floor. It's your turn. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellie. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you so much for this occasion to speak. Um, in this event organized in memory of Michael. I'm privileged to have known Michael and worked with him uh, together on the management of the journal Planning Theory. Uh, so uh, Michael and I have had uh, a number of discussions on, on both the management of the journal as well as his perspective on um, coming from a Lacanian lens. Today, however, I was going to talk about uh, a different perspective uh, on ideological fantasies, uh, taking on from the work of Nicholas Luhmann, who's, uh, who I've been fascinated with for a while. And as you'll see, he, Luhmann's works throw a significant challenge for planets. So, um, I'm going to start with explaining what Luhmann's work uh, is about. So one of the significant um, commentaries in society today is to point to the increasing complexity that we are confronted with. 
We see now, for instance, the slow waning away of institutions and entities that characterize the modern age, such as the nation state, the welfare state, the nuclear family, unquestioned science, and so on. Lyotard and others have turned the movement away from modern, uh, modernity as postmodern, emphasizing the contingent and the particular, as opposed to the more confident, linear thinking marked by faith in the universal, the power of knowledge, and some of the hallmarks of modernity. Another school of thought, however, based on system science, however, challenges this postmodern conceptualization while maintaining a claim to a world system. Nicholas Luhmann's Social Systems is a revealing and deeply challenging book of an alternate description of society, characterized by what Ulrich Beck has termed the second modernity, uh, a society that is characterized as reflexive, that has moved away from a more linear, de determined period of modernity. This presentation is about Nicholas Luhmann's autopoetic social systems and the challenge it poses to planning theorists and practitioners. Uh, okay. So Luhmann starts from the question, what is society? For him, society is an autopoetic system, and come back to that word later, that is separate and distinct from individuals and biological entities. So this is uh, a, a, a departure from, so he sees um, nature as distinctively separate from social systems. We get a system juxtaposed against an environment that consists of individuals and biological entities, a system that is characterized by what, what it is not, a system that is defined by the difference it maintains with its environment. A second important tenant um, of lumens is that um, modernity is increasingly um, defined by functional differentiation. And by functional differentiation, he, he distinguishes functional differentiation from segmentation, which is um, which, according to him, is division of society in more or less equal subsist subsystems. And he differentiates it from stratification, which, according to him, is defined by a society of unequal subsystems. So for Lohmann, society is divided called functionally, or is getting divided functionally, into systems and subsystems. Now, the difference here in, in, in seeing system in this way is that he is not defining system in terms of a whole and parts. He's not defining it as an internal structure, but is def defining it in terms of a difference from the environment. It means the structure can change and the whole and parts relationships can change without affecting the system. So in Nicholas Luhmann's uh, words, the first differentiation is by um, uh, a process where it, it's, it, is, it comes from a process where society tries to understand and deal with the complexity it is confronted with. And this is by forming uh, a, a, a reduction in complexity by forming functional subsystem. So like the education system, the legal system, the political system, the religious system, and so on. This allows the system as a whole to deal better with complexity, but also leads to an increase in overall complexity. Each functional system, while maintaining the boundary of the first differentiation, differentiates further to specialize and the process goes on, resulting in a very complex object that operates on fundamental principles of functional differentiation. Let's now come back to the word, uh, word autopoiesis. This simply means self-reproducing. That is what, that is the outputs of the system feeds back into the system. Like life, life produces life, through interaction with the environment, but not by the environment. For Lumen, the autobiotic element of social systems, like life is to biological systems, is communication. 
Society produces communication and communications produce further communications that makes it what Von Foster calls a non-trivial machine, a system that cannot read its own state. By the time it reads the state, the current state has moved on. This, this, is, fam this, phenom this is familiar to us planners who have experience with data gathering for exercises such as the master planning, for by the time the data is collected, it is, it is already outdated. In order to make meaning from communication, each has to refer back to past, each communication has to refer back to past communications. It also has to anticipate a future of potential communications. At the society level, this past communication is stored in a memory function that at the society level, we commonly refer to as culture. Memory, however, however has to be selective for everything cannot be stored. It is also therefore forgetful. Um, communications uh, must follow um, an observer, however. These communications must be done from a position. For social systems, these communications has to be from within a functional system. For Lumen, the fundamental problem of society is therefore not exploitation or suppression or happiness, but is one of inclusion or exclusion in other words, neglect by the fun functional systems. So where does this lead us? Um, uh, what is the problem? Here is a quote from Lumen that describes the problem for us planners very well. So he says, today the problem is much worse than before, but who will hear these complaints and who can react to them if the society is not in control of itself? And what can we expect when we know that the very success of the function systems depends upon neglect. When evolution has differentiated systems whose very complexity depends upon operational closure, how can we expect to include all kinds of concerns into the system? So um, this leads on to planner's dilemma, um, which is, um, the causal explanations from a central or a planner's point of view is just one among many explanations, therefore. Different causal constructions and correspondingly different solutions can be expected from within different functional systems. So that how, how can then a planner from outside functional systems project even a desired uh, future for, for, for society and realize it. it. It brings forward the problem of complexity and the problem of self-reference. In other words, it is a constructivist ontology of a polycentric society in turbulent evolution without a predictable outcome. So how can a planner then work with the inclusion and exclusion criteria to realize these plans? Um, these, these are some of the, in Lumen's words, therefore, the ideological fantasy of, um, of the concerns of different functional systems constitute just an ideological fantasy. For him, there is no point where it, uh, it is possible to make a statement about society because it comes from each, each standpoint, comes from a functional um, standards uh, within a functional system. So uh, that that mainly process a serious uh, problem for planners, and uh, which 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 is what we are, I'm, I'm trying to work with and trying to see how how that um, the, the dilemma of having functional subsystems can be resolved with the position of a planner. So thank you, that is all I wanted to say and to pose the problem of functional differentiation. Um, and thanks again to Ellie and everyone else who has been involved in the organization of this webinar. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Angelique. A very interesting um, presentation and topic uh, that uh, I, I haven't heard about 
this concept before. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, uh, our next speaker is uh, Mohsen, uh, Dr. Mohsen Mohamed from the University of Auckland. Um, please, uh, it's your turn to present your, your work. Yeah. Okay, hi everyone. Um, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon and good evening. Um, I know that you are from different part of the world. Uh, thanks for the, this opportunity actually to uh, speak today um, and be part of this mini conference. My journey actually um, as a pl playing theorist and I can say as a process structures playing theorist it started in, in 2009 when I started my PhD, you know, under supervision of Michael Gonder. I remember the first day, you know, in the, the first supervisory meeting, he gave me a, a draft of his book, the 10 words, planning in 10 words, uh, 10 words more, than, uh, more or less. Uh, it was a draft and as he was a co-author that one with Jean and, uh, you know, she kindly presented her work today as well. And uh, so it was the first time I learned about Lacan and then, you know, and special post-structuralism. And this presentation is based on my, you know, um, discussions, you know, long discussions as a PhD student and later on as a colleague, you know, uh, with Michael um, during the last uh, couple of years. And um, it's a very intense intellectual, but at the same time, enjoyable discussions with Michael. Uh, it's a, one of the things I really missed, you know, uh, about him. Um, but um, yeah, I just want to present uh, this work and you can realize actually, it's a, you know, it's a kind of, the, I'm following the path of Michael somehow regarding to the Lacan. So today I want to speak about um, the exigency of um, um, alternative fantasies for traversing uh, neoliberalist fantasies in the pla planning practice. So um, like Michael, you know, as a student of Michael, you know, I um, work on Lacan, especially Lacan's uh, discourse theory. And um, Lacan was the um, a post for uh, Freudian post -post psychoanalyst and a uh, university professor, and one of the most influential, you know, thinkers in the second half of the, the last century. And but the discourse was the course of, uh, core of the Lacan's you know, psychoanalysis, uh, psychoanalytic theory. And um, so investigated subject as a subject of the discourse. And especially for this paper, you know, I consider planner, planner and planners as a subject of the discourse. So Lacan uh, developed four, um, some people said they, you know, it's a, again, as part of the, the argument and the kind of discussions I had with Michael, I will explain that more, uh, four different social relations based on the discourses. So, Lacan uh, developed uh, four initial discourses, you know, and uh, the first one is uh, the master's discourse, refers to the um, dominance governing, commanding. The second one was the university one, discourse of the, relates to discourse of the university, which relates to the education training and, training and indoctrinating. And historic discourse, which refers to the resistance, protesting and desiring. And also the analyst discourse refers to the analyzing, transforming, and revolutionizing. And in the last uh, years of um, his life, Lacan developed a new discourse, which is most of the time, I think, overlooked um, discourse of the capitalists. Uh, and it's a, it's a kind of the discourses, you know, refers to the capitalism and uh, hegemonic ideology. So uh, for this paper, you know, I'm mainly focused on the, the discourse of the master, discourse of the capitalism under the masters and also discourse of analysts here. So what's the aim of the, the discourse? You know, as, a, as an agent, you know, we have a kind of the formula developed by Lacan. We have an agent, most of the time planner, you know, um, speaking with the others, try to transfer some knowledge here, you know, to the others. And on the beneath of the line, the, below the line, it's a kind of the truth. We learn something from our truth, all of our ideas coming from some sort of the truth but it's part of our unconscious. So what we see here as an impact of our conversation with the others, you know, is a kind of the impact. Most of the time from, from Lacanian perspective is a product, but it's a unconscious part. And the truth also is part of the unconscious part as well. So uh, when I uh, speak about the, the discourses later, I will explain more about how it works, especially regarding to the, the capitalism. So the, 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 the first discourse, which is a fundamental discourse for, uh, for Lacan, is a discourse of the master. The master is a person 
or a kind of system should be ob uh, obeyed or followed by, by slaves or with, you know, with others. Somehow, I can say that the planners, you know, especially the traditional top, uh, type of the planning system, top-down model, you know, uh, planners, they were in the position of the master, they imposed their ideas. I'm speaking about the 50s, maybe, you know, 50s and 60s, and imposed their ideas and other people should follow. But later on, it's changed, you know, we know that in the, in, during the planning history. So in that case, uh, planners, most of the time, you know, or, or the master is speaking with the, some master signifiers and create a kind of the knowledge, you know, for the for others based on the master signifiers. And that kind of the then the others somehow, you know, they they, um, they want to actually follow that. And there is a reason, for example, for uh, for a slave or the, for a servant, they, they are doing that to just catch the uh, attentions of the master and show that actually, uh, the master is a uh, the ruler and make that person or that system happy, but the, the reality, which is a kind of the concealed behind the, the master, uh, is uh, is a uh, is a the divided subject, which means that master himself or planner itself, it's not complete, it's not perfect. All the time, it has some um, you know incomplete ideas, and you can see that in the politics a lot. You know, when uh, you know kind of the rulers. They are using that and some people just taking notes, you know, around them. And, but the kind of the knowledge they create is not the knowledge, you know, for themselves. They are knowledge created for the, the servants, for the followers, you know. And uh, so it's a, it's a kind of mechanism of the master. And somehow it's a kind of the old fashion of the planning system. What about the, the current condition? We know that the market actually become quite a new master for us in the, in the capitalism, isn't it? Even von Hayek, you know, he argued that the mar market should be obeyed because it can protect us, uh, protects our freedom and also provides a kind of a well-being for us. But from Lacanian perspective, when a master's discourse established its hegemony, you know, other existing discourses should follow, uh, should follow operate under the master's discourse. Otherwise, they, they will be eliminated. If you look what happens, you know, in the reality, you know, if something, you know, in the practice of planning, if something doesn't have a kind of the financial or market type of, you know, rationality, most of the time, you know, easily rejected as a kind of, as a kind of the irrational kind of decisions or something, you know, quite not relevant to the practice. So uh, Lacan believed that modernity somehow transformed the pre-existing discourse of the master and shape it in the kind of the new format, you know, which is, the, the kind of the argument I had with Mar Michael, you know, for a couple of years, you know, because I believe that, you know, like some, 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 uh, or a, a couple of the other thinkers, you know, the capitalist discourse is a new discourse, but Michael believed that it's a, it still is a kind of the master discourse. So as you can see, the, 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 there is a similarity that somehow, and I agree with Michael regarding that one. Um, if you look to the kind of the uh, two diagrams here, we have a master, and the other one we have the capitalist one. They are almost similar. The, but the, there is a couple of the differences here. In the master one, we have the, the agent, the master. He, ha, he used the kind of the master signifiers, you know, um, the kind of the ideas, you know, sustainable development, uh, green development, or something like that. But here, the subject, the agent itself, it's, a, it's, it's kind of this divided subject. It's not happy, you know. And it's in dilemma, you know, it's not complete and knows about this. And the other thing is that if you can see, you know, most of the, the kind of the ideas coming to, to, to the agent, you know, as a kind of the, uh, master here, coming from the unconscious part, you know, but here instead, you know, when, when uh, the subject uh, person or a subject actually quite angry, this it question its own you know, um, master signifiers or the kind of the master signifiers is using. So another thing is that if you look to the masters at the end, you know, when the sticking with the others is coming back to the planner or kind of the top down ones, then people they can and the others can question the ruler at the end, you know, but there is a difference here. Um, in the discourse of capitalism, it's like a circle, you know, and the argument all the time continues. And we just create a new type of definitions for the ideas. We implement it, we test it. We are not happy with it. We assume that it's our problem. We, did, we couldn't actually define it in quite clear way. We revise it. We put another definitions for that. People get it, 
practice it, they are not happy coming to us, we redefine it and it's become like a circle, you know? And it's part of the rejection and rejection and rejection and it's created kind of the dissatisfaction all the time. So it's because of that, you know, um, in, in the context of the, um, sorry, yeah, it's a kind of hegemony, uh, kind of the neoliberalism. You know, most of the um, uh, kind of the uh, disciplines that are kind of for, uh, forcing to revise, you know, their their assumptions, their values, and and also even educational traditions. It's a reason because in the capitalist system, they are we are not we can we are not allowed to challenge in you know, the fantasy of the market. You know, markets is a kind of a master. You are not allowed to challenge it. If there is a problem, is it a problem with us? With us? It's exactly what's happening now in the housing market, for example, in Auckland. You know, we have uh, um, housing affordability issues in, in New Zealand, especially in Auckland. And most of the time, planners, you know, uh, are, are, are under attack, you know, and sometimes, you know, even uh, often planners come and say, oh, it's our fault. You know, we couldn't do that. We need to redefine our role. We need to shape or we need to behave better. We need to be more flexible for the market. So it's our fault. All the time we try to revise and change or norms, master, you know, the kind of the values and the concepts we are using and regulations and try to make it, you know, more flexible, you know, regarding to the um, what's happening in the market because we cannot keep people happy. So uh, in that case, you know, um, Lacan argued that, you know, it's a kind of the capitalist discourse is a, one of the most advanced one because it's, there is no end for this kind of revision and the redefinition. All time to consume the concepts. For example, when we had sustainable development for a couple of years, it's become quite old fashioned. We couldn't use it. And then people moved to the resilience for, for a couple of years after global, especially after the financial global crisis. And then resilience didn't work. We moved to the well being. And then after SDGs, we come back to this new sustainable development goals. And we're just you know, consuming the concepts and again and again. It's like a circle. Why it happens? Uh, Eli and I we were quite lucky. A couple of years back, uh, Alain Bajou, the French uh, philosopher, came to New Zealand, and Eli and I we were quite lucky to meet him, you know, and have a kind of a very brief, you know, uh, discussions with him. And he, uh, it was, you know, um, very interesting uh, discussions at that time. And he, he told us actually we are facing several crises, you know, financial crises, uh, environmental crises. Nowadays we are fan pandemic, for example, and most of the crises, you know. Um, generated by capitalism. And, uh, but the, uh, like, um, but you mentioned that actually for him, the main, the main problem here is a subjective, you know, kind of the crisis because we cannot imagine or even fantasize anything beyond the capitalism itself. So he said that if we want to find the solutions, we need to, uh, to find the solutions beyond the capitalism, but we are not able because we are in the kind of capitalist discourse all the time reproducing, redefining the new concept, use it and going and going and going. Why? Because we are entangled in the kind of the fantasy because fantasy uh, helps capitalism actually to um, uh, order the things, you know, and also kind of the conceal all the kind of fractions and the kind of the problems associated with this, this one. And especially regarding to, uh, to the kind of the, from my perspective, primary fantasy of capitalism is that there is no other alternative uh, for capitalism. Everything should be considered as a kind of the market driven and solutions for the market failure should be found within the capitalism. But, um, and if we can't do it, it's not the fault of the, the market, you know, it's our fault because we are, we cannot challenge the, the master, you know, we are not obedient enough, you know, we need to, we need to be flexible, question ourselves why we are not accepted. But I think it's something wrong, especially I don't understand myself, I don't, I don't identify myself as a planner in that context, you know, so I'm thinking about how we can address this issue. So, uh, it's a kind of the, the discussions I had with Michael regarding the role of the uh, the, uh, the analyst kind of um, the, um, discourse. The counter hegemonic planning should challenge the main capitalist fantasy by offering solutions beyond the capitalist and its hegemonic discourse. And for to do that, I'm going to refer to the the fourth, you know, Lacan's you know uh, discourse, which is the analyst discourse. And in that case, we need to go to people. They are not happy, they are suffering, learning from their concepts, learning from their language, learning from their master signifiers. 
and use it as a planner in our plans. And just, you know, by doing that, we can, you know, fantasize the kind of the solutions for the future. Otherwise, we cannot be able to do it. Um, uh, especially quite, um, you know, inspired by uh, a paper in the colonizing planning, you know, written by uh, um, Tania, actually. Um, and she has a, she kindly presented her work today. And uh, she mentioned that how in South Africa, for example, they can use, you know, kind of the terminologies and um, from that context to solve the issues. And in New Zealand context, I can say that, you know, the kind of the Maori planning and the kind of Pacific perspective can be used. And obviously we need to go to people and learn from their discourses, not just rely on what we have and what we learn in the capitalist context. And uh, sorry, uh, sorry again for, um, for the kind of technical issues. And uh, yeah, it was my presentation for today. Hopefully you, you enjoyed and find it useful. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mohsen. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Xuan Wang uh, from the Southeast University, Nanjing, China. Uh, the stage is yours, Xuan. Hello. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. OK. So I think it's very good um, connection with Mosin actually, because today I'm going to talk something beyond the neoliberalism, which I feel might be interesting. So um, I think it might be more like a open questions, open up a new issues rather than have like a very heavy series because this is something new I have done. So first I'd like to... I'd like to introduce how I met Michael. Actually, I'm not Michael's student, but Michael has influenced me a lot. So in 2017, it was my almost the ending years of my PhD, I met Michael. At that time, I was very confused about my research because there's nobody in Edinburgh was doing this research. And I present my research on four discourses and the British UK uh, urban village campaign. And Michael gave me very good comments and also exchange our context. And later I was introduced by the AESO uh, Young Academic Network and we um, combined this uh, booklet together. It was after my graduation. And uh, also because of his encouragement, I first modified my research um, and finished my PhD in uh, 2018. So, I mean, I was more determined to be a Lacanya series, at least a part of my research after I met uh, uh, Michael. So I have invited Michael several times to our school, but it was big pity and I was very sad when I saw the news. So today I'm going to talk something very interestingly. Um, so Michael has explained how fantasies are conducted or sustained in the planning organizations, uh, urban policy making, planning delivery in the context of a new liberalism in planning. So in my course, fantasy acts as an ideological mechanism to anchor our effect with symbolic ideas so that narratives allow to provide coordinations for subject collective desires in pursuit of good cities. So all of this is actually based on a new liberalism capitalism polity with periodical election pressures. But what if it's, it's a different context? So today I'm going to explain a little bit about, I would extend Michael's MC of analyzing ideology and fantasy to another new context, arguing that the action of planning uh, inherently produce fantasies, no matter whether it is new liberal. So different from the new liberalism growing machine, Scholars has argued that Chinese urban development is a type of state entrepreneurialism as a governance from the combine of planning centrality and market instruments. So I just want to link with what Mosin just said. He says there's something beyond capitalism. So we were kind of, we, we regard ourselves as a market oriented economy, but we never regard ourselves as capitalism, even many of our people say it's a capitalist already. So I think it's just trying to do something beyond the capitalist itself, 
but still found it's very tricky way. So one thing I want to emphasize is big difference is the land ownership system. So all the land in China is actually owned by states, supplied by rental, by the government agencies. So it means it's all monopoly. So it means no one can supply your land at all. So this may actually completely change the, the, the logic behind the urban development here. But today I'm going to talk about a very small issues. Uh, also very interesting issues, uh, territorial spatial planning. So it's a new and it's the only spatial system in China after the 2018 government uh, institution reform. So I will just briefly introduce what happened. So before this, we have many different plans from how we develop it. And for master plans, as all we know, land use is specified how to arrange land. And also we have also some specific plans like eco environmental planning. So there's many conflicts between these plans and also, but this is a kind of a balance because uh, from, dif from different uh, uh, government departments, they have different uh, pursue, different uh, motivations. So they can't find a middle point, but since we agreed there are many problems. So the early actions is we try to coordinate them together. So we call it a multiple planning integration pilot program since 2014. But this is all in coordination. I think everyone understand. But suddenly there is a big reform happened three years ago and we just combine all of them together. So Minister of Housing and Urban Rural Development is actually in charge of mass planning. So this is what I will feel like it's more commonly agreed to what planning is or at least what urban planning is. But then we found or maybe I have to change this, it's better. So then we found this like a biggest difference uh, in three different types of plants. They are all just combined together. So you will see some are like more micro strategic spatial arrangements. Some are more focused on the um, urban area and some are like more about all the land, particularly focused on the nature. So I, I will just introduce briefly. So it's a very micro project. So this try to have master plans from five levels, from the national level to the town level. And they have three different types of plans, like a master plan, details plan, and also specific issues plan. And most very restrictly, it's just try to arrange every piece of the land. So they have three types of area, means every piece of the land should be a part of them. So it means no exceptions. And as they also try to make the very restricted control with three critical control lines. Here is the illustration how it works. There's some overlaps in the critical lines, but in general, it's just a more like controlling, um, I would say philosophy. So, but what happened? If it works well, I don't think I'm going to present here, but the problem is there's many things happened. So no, no plans have been approved in the past three years and provincial plans haven't been succeeded. And there's a big in, like, conflict between the department, between the minister, the professional planners, and also the planning scholars. So I try to interview five frontline planners who are working in the large planning institute in China, also have experience in charge of TSP plans. So I think this is a way how we can know the real problems so there actually there are many, many problems here as they, uh, they tell me, but I don't want to extend too much due to the limit of time. But I was argued, actually this, all of these things, like territory spatial plans, it's actually from a length. The length is just a big conflict among different types of plans. So this ideology here is if all territory spatial arrangement was systematically uh, managed at all levels, means five levels, all the conflicting so chaotic issues pertaining to planning would be eliminated. But we found there's more problems emerged after this or synthesize of everything. So if I would say this is maybe it's from ideology to ideological fantasy of totality, actually face more problems later. So I want to briefly introduce what's the major problems or how it links with Lacan's let me see on the fantasy or ideology analysis. So first I will say it's a scale. Scale is a big problem. 
So it's just different. Uh, I mean, as planners, we all know, like for the big scale, small scales, you have different tools to treat with them. But for this uh, territory spatial planning, they feel like they can control every possible land, every piece of the land with the support of the digital database. And one of the reason is they are mainly from the, uh, 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 the force of the natural resources management. So for them is they are analyze the existing part rather than predict what's going to happen. And they want to com like complete the translate all the information among the five levels of database. So this makes it very difficult. And so one of the interviewers says, so things should be considered in, uh, in different, sorry, I write it around, wrote it wrong. So it's different skills, but they all appear in the same plan. The second is to say, try to have a, a, a myth about the scientific. So they try to use scientific to so solve all the problems. They think all the land can be determined by the land survey with technology uh, and also evaluation could be uh, finished by computing evaluation. But my interviewee says, all this stuff is totally fake. How to determine this coefficient weight of each parameter? And that breaking point can just be manipulated. So, so in this system, they always scouting the human because the human points can be changed. But what I want to argue here, actually, this is a human we, we want to live in the, in the cities we want, to, we want to create. And this is the reason why planning is, is, exists. So here is, a, I illustrate a very interesting example here. So to try to have like a, a, a city and a town development boundary because they feel like after computing, it should be a coherent, it should be like a, a, a very, it can achieve compact urban development. But this is what actually, okay, well, this is still in progress, provide one of the interviews. You can see actually, because this blue lines is a potential development land, to try to, because municipality don't want to lose the uh, right to, to develop. So actually they put everything they think might be possible into this. So in the end, the, the, the land become even more fragmented than these actions in the end. Uh, but they said they claim this all uh, calculated by the, by the computer, by the data, but the result actually is manipulated by human cells. So the last one is, I would say the planners are split subjects. They don't know what to do because there's a big conflict between the mechanism behind it. So because as I introduced, it's, it's a very top-down uh, systems of this TSP, they want to control everything. But this is more the logic from the agricultural or, or ecological protections. But for, for the, I would say city land uh, development, it's mainly rely on the economic development. How can we decide who can develop and who can't? So in the end, all this right becomes amount allocation. So one of the interviews say, this is a total amount for sure. I heard it's even the provinces haven't yet allocated clear yet, no matter to say the provinces to the cities. So all the cities actually are not doing a better plan, actually try to win all more their shares. Anyway, if you can get a big piece of land means you have better uh, rights of land. So it's not market logic at all. It's more about top down political power. So, the last part I want to say, even um, it's not a new liberal context, it is still construct a promise of a coherent, harmonious and better environment. Uh, but this logic is slightly different. In the new liberalism, it's the most important is to construct ideological fantasy for the general public to believe in the vision. But why in the Chinese context? Actually, this ideological fantasy is created by for itself. The subjects are not the planners or human beings because it's a power top-down, strong top-down power. But actually, this is the subjects as masters who are conducting this planning reform. Um, so I hear I, I suggest something not for the planners, but more for the, 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 the government or government officials who are conducting these ones. I think. 
just to count, we, we can't think this radical change of planning system can solve all the problem instantly because many of the problems are beyond plan itself. And also I want to quote what uh, uh, Gondon and Hillier said before. So probably we need a trajectory of graduate changes to incrementally optimize the TSP system rather than just to construct the impossible fantasies for a perfect, perfect ending status. Here is some suggestion for this change. I don't, don't want to extend more here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean, uh, for an interesting case from China. Um, um, based on the order that we have, um, I'm the next um, presenter. Uh, I was the, uh, one of the um, PhD students of Michael Gonder, and I had this great opportunity to learn from uh, Michael and work with Michael closely. Uh, and uh, uh, we had long, uh, enjoyable discussions on every chapter that we, uh, we had. Um, and uh, I specifically, I was uh, more interested in the logic of contingency, uh, and um, the logic was one of my favorite um, discussions and uh, topic of the philosophy. And I like the logic of contingency and how it is possible to use logic of contingency to traverse the phantasmatic logic of uh, capitalism. Uh, so this was one of the topics that we had a discussion with Michael. Um, specifically, I, we discussed a lot about my work experience that I have in the Ministry of Housing um, and um, different pri public and private companies in different uh, places. Um, so um, uh, so I just I'm, I'm sorry, I just received a, a a message. Uh, so um, uh, we, we discussed how paradoxical policies and strategies and failures in planning um, can be rooted in the uh, capitalism and what is the role of capitalism and how we can fix th these problems uh, under capitalism and if it is possible at all. Um, um, the, the discussion that we had, and based on what I've learned from Michael and also from uh, Disco, um, and, and, and Essex School of Discourse Analysis and following um, discursive analysis of Lacanian approach, um, um, I uh, define the phantasmatic logics of capitalism as a multi-layer mechanism, not just fantasy, a multi-layer mechanism that conceals impossibility and failures of capitalism. And uh, these logic of fantas uh, these phantasmatic logics present uh, capitalism as a discourse without any alternatives. So despite its failures, the system, the system still is working as a hegemonic discourse. Um, for example, the first uh, component of uh, phantasmatic logics based on the um, a success school of discourse analysis and following Locklaw and Move it, um, is fantasy itself. Fan fantasies such as uh, fundamental fantasies of capitalism, free market operation, equilibrium point of the market, uh, equilibrium point between demand and supply. That is mainly not really discourse of planners, but politicians and sustainability, resilient cities, smart cities, livable cities, and currently mission economy. SDGs, Green New Deal, that is offered by one of the uh, Schumpeterian economies to uh, politicians and senators in, uh, uh, in, in political parties. Um, we, we have an interesting uh, fantasy in Iran that is very similar to the neoliberal no fantasy. Um, uh, we have different types of fantasies operating at the same time, and it resulted in just a release, land release policies in the suburban areas of, for example, a metropolitan area like Tehran. Um, the government, uh, many years ago, um, they uh, announced that the land belongs to God, and land use planning and zoning are against it. 
So that is very similar to the neoliberal discourse. Market is a new God and planning regulations and planning zoning is against the free market operation. And also abolishing planning institution and regulation as a Western discourse was another fantasy that was advertised at that time by the government. And also we had reductionist analysis of, you know, the fundamental fantasy of market equilibrium between demand and supply. So land release policies was uh, one of the uh, most popular policies in, in, in Iran. As a result, we had lots of informal settlements around the city. We released the land, land is, belongs to God, and also official system of planning created this type of homes for upper income classes. We divided duties, official planning institutions produce houses for higher income groups and middle income groups and the lower income groups they they are making their own home in informal settlements that is not really bad quality homes um we have another type of uh fantasmatic logic in oakland the survival of failures uh, the the survival of laconian lack First, we um, denied any type of housing crisis in Auckland, including um, um, any markets in, in New Zealand, including Auckland. So land release policies was just uh, a way of providing housing because um, we, were, uh, we, we were blamed planning regulations and planning zoning as a barrier for more free market operation. Um, the national the previous government blamed planning and then just recently the new government also they are blaming planning so as michael said planning regulations and planning um, system itself is a scapegoat for for capitalism and the second logic of phantasmatic logic the second mechanism the third mechanism is drive that i developed in my work and it was published um, last year. Uh, um, I think the mechanism of drive uh, is even more than desire and more than more important than fantasy. This is the operation that we see in social media specifically, and it works through algorithm of proof of stake and authority. It's specifically in Twitter and TikTok. Uh, it presents partial enjoyment for the users and it creates excitement, excitement. And in, increasingly, we replace um, symbolic prohibitive norms by new imaginary ideals. Through so, um, ideals of social success, professional success, and bodily fitness. And it it is operating very similar in the um, in the in planning and land market and housing market so uh, the phantasmatic logics they try to conceal over the logic of contingency for this course of capitalism uh, we need fantasies to maintain the desire of feeling the lack to fixing the failures of the system although we know that is it, it, it is impossible to feel fully the failure of the capitalism. And then we have another mechanism drive that is in comparison to fantasy is a perversion. It compels this bourgeoisie subjectivity to circulate around the failures of the system and take surplus enjoyment and surplus financial surpluses. And so uh, basically we, we, think the, uh, we think the lack or affordable housing on affordable housing is not a problem it's the source of income so we invert the uh, the system and the mechanism of fantasy and desire and we follow drive and it is not my argument james galbraith the theorician of neoliberal economic change says neoliberal economic growth is based on inflation on the good part of the economy that is housing and land um, actually, logic of contingency for me is different from Locklo and, and Zizek and MOVE and Essex School Discourse Analysis. They believe logic of contingency, contingency to the hegemonic ideology of capitalism, is within the discourse and it can be presented 
and show the failures. We can deconstruct the fantasies. It seems it is, ra it is rational and practical based on the political, um, economic point of view. If we change the pieces in the chess play, we can create a new game. But I think it is not a solution. We cannot um, deal with the fantasmatic logics of capitalism if we play a game chess. Even if we color our hair, if we change our style, if we change the style of the pieces, still we are playing chess. I'm not talking about the losing guitar and, and I, I don't want to romanticize the nom nomadology and the nomad concept of the lose of and guitar, but I, I think we need a new discourse. Uh, Non-Western discourses, for example, Iranian philosophy may offer some values and ethical dimensions that uh, they are not allowed to be presented in the hegemonic discourse of uh, and dominant discourse of capitalism. We need to change the whole game, not just the, the game, probably a new game instead of chess, backgammon can, can be an option. Um, that's from me. Um, um, the next um, speaker is Christina Granger, Professor Christina Granger from Chalmers University of Technology from Sweden. Uh, this stage is yours, Christina. Thanks, thank you for being patient. Thank you very much. So I will share my screen. So I would like to present the collaboration I did together with uh, Michael uh, in 2018, which ended up with a joint paper uh, with the title, The Urban Domination of the Planet, Iran's Aryan Critique. And it was published in Planning Theory. And I also just want to say that it's, it's so sad that Michael can't join us during this conference because <laughs> somehow it would be have had been great to have had his comments on all the presentations we are doing. Uh, but for this paper I wrote together with Michael, uh, the background is that he came to Gothenburg, uh, Sweden during May, June 2017 as a guest professor, which was very nice. And uh, we explored different ideas about how to collaborate. And we talked about perhaps writing something about uh, Julia Kristeva uh, or Jacques Rancière. And in the end, uh, it, it became something on Jacques Rancière. And the background was that I had just recently come to Gothenburg um, to the University of Chalmers. Uh, and I had joined um, a research group which had a focus on uneven development uh, and I had not myself worked on that so I felt very much that I needed a paper on that so we somehow decided to try to work on that and also uh, connect it to the theories of Jacques so it became a paper on how uneven development and more specifically a recent debate on planetary urbanization as a new epistemology can be understood and critiqued through Jacques Rancière's concept, the distribution of the sensible or the partition of the sensible. And I also want to emphasize how genuinely kind Michael was uh, for, so for him, it was obvious that our names should appear in alphabetical order, and it was not something I could discuss with him. So it became a paper where I was the first author, but that is not necessarily how the writing process uh, proceeded. <clears throat> and for Michael, it was also very important that the paper should be published in planning theory, <clears throat> because as an editor of planning theory, he felt that he, he had not been able to publish in planning theory for so many years. And I also think that uh, this was a way of exploring a new, new way of understanding ideologies for him. So um, Michael, for example, wrote this in the article that Rancière's Partition of the sensible is essentially an aesthetic approach to ideology that operates 
via what is made accessible to the senses and also what is allowed to make sense. So it was something that was not primarily building on discourse and the symbolic use uh, in a more traditional critical theory. So uh, I think this became something else, but it was still a continuation of his interest in ideology. And I think that what we, hmm. for some reason now I can't swap. Uh, the ideological fantasy that we explored in this paper was the proposition by Brenner and Schmidt that all urban development in the world can be explained with a single epistemological framework. And we are certainly not the only ones critiquing, critiquing this, uh, but perhaps uh, we added this idea of how to understand it ideologically through uh, Rancière's concepts, and I will come back to that. And we also think that this uh, ideological fantasy, it has universalizing implications. And the most important thing is perhaps that it fails fundamentally in recognizing exclusion and marginalization. So uh, what we did was a critical analysis of the contemporary debate about planet planetary urbanization mostly occurring in urban studies and geography journals, uh, such as Environment and Planning A, Urban Geography, City, Iger, but not so much in planning theory uh, journals. And the background of planetary urbanization was a concept re reinvigorated by Brenner Schmidt to promote a new epistemology of the urban. And one of their main arguments was that more than half of the population now lives in cities and that we can talk about an urban age. However, we emphasize that developed land covers at most 3% of the global land surface and built on land covers no more than 0.65%. And even for most OECD countries, less than 10% is considered urban. So we thought that there is reason to critically reflect on the concept. And what about the, the people residing on the other 97% of the global surface? And should planners really have the urban as its starting point in all matters? And uh, Brenner and Schmidt, um, used some of Lefebvre's work from the 1970s and onwards. Uh, but what we saw, sorry, that Lefebvre is describing a coming threat while Brenner and Schmidt seemed to promote planetary urbanization. So Lefebvre said another threat, the planetarization of the urban, it will span all of space during the third millennium if nothing manages to control its movements the worldwide expansion entails the major risk that space will be homogenized and that diversities will be annihilated. While Brenner and Schmidt said that rather than being relegated to a non-urban outside, um, therefore the moment of extended urbanization must be viewed as an integral terrain of the urbanization process as a whole. And I will not go in so deeply to what uh, Brenner Schmidt uh, put in the concept of planetary urbanization, but try to explain a bit about the difference between their view and their critics, because there were lots of critics. Uh, so on the one hand, they are very critical to how the urban is used in urban theory. And they say, for example, that the urban appears to have become a quintessential floating signifier, devoid of any clear definition of parameters, morphological coherence, or cartographic fixity. Its definitional contours have become unmanageably slippery. But on the other hand, they come to the conclusion that there is no longer any outside to the urban world. Uh, and it is from this position that they argue for a new epistemological framework 
Uh, however, it should be emphasized that they have later withdrawn from this position that there is no outside to the urban world. But at this at this point in view, uh, time in view, it it was what they had said. So there are also very many counter narratives to planetary urbanization, and it's it stimulated a lot of debate, especially in urban studies and geography journals. Uh, and many critical voices, especially from post-colonial and feminist urban theory. Uh, so for example, Derrickson said, the desire to explain the world in its totality, to master the universe, is hard to resist, but it's a, a conceit in which only some can luxuriate. And Roy, for example, emphasized the constitutive outside as an important perspective. Walker questioned how planetary urbanization can effectively erase the rural when the rural other has not been fully internalized by the urban. And Oswin emphasized that urban injustice has no center and progressive urban theory must not have one either. And uh, when the replies to um, their proposal were uh, published in different journals, uh, Brenner Schmidt became very disappointed and thought that the replies often were caricatures or deliberate misrepresentations. But I think it's, it's very obvious that they had different ideas about the key issues. So, Brenner Schmidt stated that it felt like an extremely unwieldy and men, in, in many ways unpalatable task to reply to these uh, replies. And they stated that the main question must be how can we most effectively decipher and influence emergent patterns and pathways of urban transformation. So they wanted to detect the development of ongoing pathways. While many of their critics, like for example, uh, Yassil, said that I think we need more of that pondering over untranslatability, over those moments that give you glimpses into difference, the supplement, the residue, call it what you will, irreconcilable difference. So what their critics felt was the key issue, I think, was uh, the question, which patterns are we bound to see and which patterns are effectively erased from our cognitive map? And that was not something that could be um, caught with the epistemological framework that Brenner Schmidt proposed for the whole uh, world. And then uh, Michael and I tried to introduce Jacques Rancière's theories to understand this. Uh, and to show how certain privileged modes of making sense create spatial and temporal borders of domination. And Rancière used, uh, for example, three different um, um, concepts. And it's the police, which is a certain way of dividing up the sensible, and the distribution of the sensible which is about the visible and the sayable, about who sees and who does not see, who speaks and who makes noise, etc. And just dissensus, which is the demonstration and manifestation of a gap in the sensible. And that's where politics can play out. And I shouldn't go too far into that as time is running out, but the conclusion then is that <clears throat> planetary urbanization is a partition of the sensible, which risks providing a depoliticizing approach to the outside. And planetary urbanization is inadequate when it comes to articulating claims for equality and fails in recognizing exclusion, exclusion and marginalization. And it also fails in making visible that which was not seen, heard, or named, and thus in acknowledging these outsides as potential stages where disruptive politics can be played out. So in this regard, we feel that planetary urbanization can be understood as an ideological fantasy, and planning theories need theories with an outside, to quote Yassil and Roy.
So thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Uh, that was amazing. Uh, I really like your, this work with uh, that you have done with Michael. And it shows how Michael was interested in different uh, area of philosophy and covered different concepts. That was one of the most amazing works. Thank you for, for your uh, interesting presentation. Um, uh, the next speakers are um, Associate Professor Crystal Legacy from the University uh, from the Melbourne School of Design, University of Melbourne, and Dr. Andy Inch from the University of Sheffield, the UK. And the stage is yours. Thanks very much, Eddie. Shall I Hi, share Crystal. screen? Yeah. Yeah, please. Thanks. That's great. So we're doing a bit of a double act uh, this morning from opposite ends of the world, which I think is a first for me. So uh, ho hopefully uh, it will work. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to take the, the first bit and then I'm going to hand on to uh, to Crystal to make sense of everything for you after I've kind of <laughs> uh, uh, set out some of the kind of framework. Um, so so I'd like to start by just say, saying thanks very much to Ellie and Mosin and everyone involved. Um, in setting up the conference today. It's kind of a real honor for, I think for both of us to, to uh, be able to speak here. I didn't know Michael well personally, but his work was really influential in shaping a lot of my ongoing thinking about what, uh, what a critical planning theory can be and what it means to conduct uh, critical research and critically theoret theoretically orientated research in planning. I've really enjoyed all of the thoughtful perspectives so far. Um, including some really great photos of Michael hanging out in Lisbon, I think, which is a, a city I have a particular affinity with. Um, this is a, very much a work in progress. It's not in a directly Lacanian dialect. So, um, uh, but um, when the invitation came along, Crystal and I had been talking for some time, looking for ways to direct some of our shared interests. Uh, and uh, so we will, we will try and set out, I think, a kind of um, an, an outline of an argument that we'll hope to develop in, in writing subsequently. So although our abstract mentioned some empirics, we decided to kind of park those uh, for the sake of time really, because we don't have uh, very long, just to try and set out the shape of an argument instead. Um, so can we move this slide along? Is that all right, Crystal? Thanks. Um, so to try and situate then uh, broadly wh where we're coming from, what we want to argue, I think the middle quote here from Rachel Weber is particularly helpful. Urban governance rests on a foundation of expectancy and speculative future thinking. Um, I think that the idea that planning trades in, in images of the future uh, through which it seeks to shape material worlds is kind of nece uh, by necessity kind of foundational to the enterprise of planning. Um, and is very evident in long-standing links to ideas of utopia or ideal cities that have kind of informed and shaped some of the kind of uh, imaginaries of the discipline over time. Uh, so although this is known, though, I don't think it's always been centered in analyses, methods, approaches within the discipline. Um, and, and perhaps um, particularly whilst, whilst, I, whilst I've been learning about it, that might be because uh, to some extent people haven't felt that we've been making real choices about our futures for some time, maybe. Uh, and so that's maybe something to, to, to think about why it is that the future maybe disappeared a bit from planning thinking uh, and seems to have, have kind of made a reappearance uh, recently. Um, and I think that the, the Lacanian approach as developed by, by Michael uh, and including through his work with Jean Hillier, whose paper on, on nature-based solutions earlier on illustrated this, this really well, taken as a body represents probably one of the most well-developed approaches to kind of critically psychoanalyzing uh, this, this role of kind of imaginaries or images of the future um, and, and uh, the, the, uh, the various ways, critically analyzing them in the sense of the various ways that they can, they can shape fantasies uh, and fantasies that reach down to, sort of into people practices, uh, people and practices in quite profound ways. So not just shaping planning's kind of rational understanding of itself, but shaping uh, at a kind of deep and often un even unconscious level, the ways in which we desire certain kinds of futures uh, and the kind of objects that planning is interested in, which I think is, is a really profound and, and important uh, kind of point of departure for further critical theorizing about, uh, about the nature um, of planning and its relationship to, uh, to futures. So I think this, this idea that, that futures matter is, has made a bit of a comeback um, over recent decades, uh, recent years in particular, and across a, a, wi a wider range of disciplines than, than just in planning as well. I think it's quite interesting to note people like Jens Beckert's work uh, in economics 
think, thinking about the ways in which uh, economics too is profoundly shaped by imaginaries of the future and how images of the future actually uh, help to coordinate and shape the, uh, the um, social action really and maintain social order through time by shaping people's exp expectations, their aspirations uh, and their understandings of, 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 uh, of uh, how the world will be, but also of, of their kind of desires uh, and aspirations for what the world could be. So I wonder whether this is at a time when we're feeling kind of a loss uh, and of, of certainty around the future, uh, a huge amount of fear and anxiety around the nature of our planetary futures, uh, I kind of turn back to understanding uh, and trying to understand the kind of uh, the sociology of, of the future uh, is, is uh, very pertinent. Um, can we move the slide on, um, Crystal? So we, I think we know uh, these images come from uh, Plan Melbourne. Uh, Crystal's uh, dug them out. Um, and I think they, they, they show how plans and kind of uh, operate in fundamentally ideological terms in this way, projecting imagined relations to real conditions that are producing urban change uh, and projecting imaginary relations onto the real prospects for governing those processes. Um, so uh, plans effectively project imaginaries which are, are deeply infused by power uh, and deeply infused by, uh, by ideological uh, understandings, ideological projections, which can distort uh, or, or, or create particular partial ways of seeing, uh, which can uh, obfuscate uh, the realities of change and, and our real prospects for governing them. Um, so I think this kind of sense of, of a critical analysis of these kinds of projections is, is, is foundational to a critical planning theory. And we need, uh, we need to maintain a real commitment to, to deconstructing uh, these, these kinds of images. Um, can we move the slide on? We don't want to sit and think about uh, in this paper though uh, entirely about this kind of act of critical deconstruction. Uh, we'd like to try and move on, I think, also to, to think about what it means to reconstruct or to construct. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of us here would no doubt share an understanding that there's a need for alternatives to, uh, to uh, contemporary modes, uh, contemporary imaginaries and contemporary modes of urban development. Um, but that there's been a sense that, uh, of, of, a, of, of a difficulty in articulating or establishing uh, powerful alternatives. Critical social science has been implicated in this and critical theory uh, at, at times uh, uh, and variously across disciplines, accused of being less effective at explicating some of its own underlying normative commitments that frame its critique and therefore less effective at building and constructing alternatives so that it's easier to deconstruct and to critique than it is to construct and to understand how that critique contributes to construction and, and contributes, to the, the, uh, contributes to the construction of alternatives and alternative images of the future. I think the so what question is a question which is often asked in planning theory and often to kind of rather breezily dismiss, I think, critical approaches. So I, I think there's kind of a, that the rush to pragmatic action uh, at times leads to a certain kind of impatience uh, with, with the need to really explore the dialectical tensions uh, within planning research between critique and construction uh, and that the kinds of construction that critique leads on to uh, and the nature of those relationships. So I think uh, Michael was interested in this uh, in his work and Tanya's paper spoke wonderfully to this earlier as did uh, uh, Shuan's. Um, but I wonder whether this idea of no longer being enthralled to fantasy is as well explored as the critique in existing work and whether there isn't further work to do to, to think through what it means to traverse relationships to fantasy and to build alternatives. How is that possible? What work is required to do that? Where can we find that happening in practices? What kinds of practices can we build to, to traverse uh, prevailing fantasies, but perhaps also to explore how we can build alternative fantasies if we understand uh, following Becker and others and, and uh, Rachel Weber that, that we are kind of uh, uh, fundamentally involved in, in, in the construction of urban imaginaries uh, and uh, a foundation of speculation and speculative futures thinking, then we need to be able to construct alternative fantasies and understand how we can commit people to them. Uh, so I've been particularly influenced in thinking about that through uh, the work of Miguel Abensor, uh, who speaks about utopia uh, as the education of desire and is interested in, in how we can explore through uh, utopian practices and writing ways of, of, uh, of learning to aspire differently, to teach desire to desire, to desire better, to desire more, and above all, to desire in a different way. So how can we rethink what we desire and our fantasies? And that's the kind of the, the dropping off point where I'm gonna hand over to Crystal to explain how we're gonna try and think about some of this stuff uh, in practice, I think.
Thanks, Andy. And so as we think about alternative fantasies, we're going to take planning theory to the streets. So taking planning theory out of professional planning offices and onto the streets to understand the practices of ideology, critique and construction to the dialect within planning conflicts and citizen movements. So we're going to go into those informal spaces of planning and and help to um, theorize in this space. So some of the questions guiding our early thinking is how are, how are alternative fantasies shaped in and through collective struggle? Can alternative fantasies organize political opposition to dominant modes of neoliberal urban development and generating and channeling a, a desire for change? And to what extent can new collective subjectivities and forms of power be created in the reflexive construction of alternative fantasies? So these are some of the questions that are motivating uh, these early discussions um, Andy and I are currently having. So although we're not speaking to uh, a particular case study, these images are from uh, empirical work that I've been doing here in Melbourne over a number of years through critical participatory action research. And some of the sort of the questions that are being raised by our shared interest in looking at community um, collective and community movements is drawing on is to, is to to look at how critique and construction are intimately linked in citizen and community movements through these informal acts of resist resistance and these acts are both grounded in place but also have long temporalities or rather time scales through which there is considerable scope for evolution growth and creation of political subjectivities that are collectively felt and owned by citizen actors. And critique and construction can be seen as twin features of movement building and organizing that emerge in and through planning conflicts in space and in time. So by examining these spaces and temporalities, what we might find is, find is a working out of what individuals and groups are uh, railing against, but also what are they proposing and, and in support for. So again, what role can fantasies potentially play in these alternative constructions of futures through these informal practices of planning? So the latter may be predicated or grounded in an informal grassroots and emergent fantasy about the possibilities of future action and lived experiences in cities. So the articulation of what a movement or a group may be for is expressed through temporal processes where a fixed fantasy in time and space may evolve through periods of critique and infusions of hope and alternative promises of the future. To which it's not just Rogan Morton's planners who need to tell persuasive stories about the future. And it's not just Lacanian planning theorists who engage in ideology critique of dominant planning fantasies. These acts of critique and construction are constitutive parts of campaigns too. Even if not well understood on, on, so on those terms, they apply out certainly in complex ways. So in this way, the paper seeks to take planning theory onto the streets and into grassroots campaigns. And in doing so, we see planning theory as both, or planning in these informal spaces as both messy, insurgent, and led by and through communities emerging as political actors and cultivating collective political subjectivities and power to not just construct alternative imaginaries, but to establish new possibilities for planning's politics. So in conclusion, um, I just want to note, so these are kind of where we're going with the paper, is to ask the questions and to consider what role fantasies and images of the future in planning conflict and citizen movements might play. So not just in the official formal offices of planning and questioning whether and how ideology critique and construction emerge in and through practices of struggle and collective engagement. So situating the constructive work of fantasies and future imaginaries, what work do they do in making up new desiring subjects from the grassroots, educating desire to frame demands across horizons and moving from opposition critique towards the articulation of new desires construction. So building people together in collective projects towards the future. So that, that I'll end there. I see that we're over time and I apologize for that. But again, as everyone has echoed, I want to thank Ellie and Mosen absolutely for this fantastic discussion today. I'm absolutely delighted to be part of it. So well done. And um, I look forward to some questions and some discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Andy and Christoph, for, for the amazing presentation. That was a really interesting uh, presentation because uh, I think all the speakers, they, they were talking about more theoretical frameworks, but you brought that theories into the grassroots and the people and public. That was amazing. Uh, 
uh, I really enjoyed uh, all the presentations. Um, so it's time for Q and A. Uh, uh, we have um, uh, some participants at the moment, so please ask your question if you like. I think I can. Uh, open even yes the speaker this uh, speaker for you you can even ask questions or you can type your question um, any question for speakers oh yes Jean I so I was see trying to give one. others a, a chance so that's why I slyly slid my hand up um Question for, for Mohsen, I'm really interested in the, the fifth, I'll take my hand down now, the fifth Lacanian discourse, the capitalist discourse. And I, I fully understand um, how you explain it and everything. Given with the Glasgow COP that's going on at the moment, which seems to be dominating the news here, do you think there is a role for the hysterics discourse? Do you think that the protesters, the activists, it would fit the hysterics, hysterics discourse and how might it work in, 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 in the COP situation? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Um, uh, it's very, uh, like, to be honest, I wanted actually to refer to the yeah, actually summit. Uh, to be honest, I don't have any hope for, for politicians because they are part of the uh, capitalist system. They just reproduce, you know, um, uh, the new concept for us and cre uh, create a new uh, master signifiers and then just be done people and then just continue because uh, we know that it's, uh, it's around the, from 1980s, we, are, we had this kind of discussions, we had this kind of, you know, discourses from politicians. But regarding to the protesters, um, um, to, be to be honest, I have a hope for the for people. You know, we need to, as a planner, we need to work with people. You know, and um, and as uh, for some Crystal and Andy mentioned that you know the kind of the concepts and see and train them how they should desire something new and construct, not just the, the questioning them, how we can actually create a new desires for them, and. Um, you know, um, and especially regarding, for example, the book you wrote, you know, um, uh, going behind the horizon, you know, I, you wrote it a couple of years back about the Aboriginals, you know, perspective regarding your land, you know, which is quite different from the, what we have in the kind of the official planning system, which is more cost benefits model. So if, if, the, if the protesters looking to the land, looking to the environment, you know, uh, from, different perspective, not necessarily the way capitalism informed them, we have a hope. I think in that case, we need to kind of uh, uh, return to the some some concepts and some some forgotten type of discourses, you know, in society in Australia, for example, Aboriginals in New Zealand, Maori, you know, Pacific people in different part in U US, for example, you know, um, kind of the Native Americans. So it's a kind of the discourse, we need to work with the com communities, we need to work with the people and look to the alternatives and bring that kind of the concepts. And it's again, uh, what, for example, Tanya mentioned, you know, uh, in her, uh, her work, you know, um, in the colonizing planning, we need to listen to people using their kind of the master signifiers, just, you know, not just rely on what we gain at the university and repeat it. It's the only solution, I think. There's a question for Andy and Crystal. Uh, can you can you see the question or no? Um, I can I, I, I can see it if you like, Ellie. I can I can read it so Crystal can answer it. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I like to take planning theory down to the streets and to engage with citizens and their communities. Uh, and I wonder what this means in terms of our own language as theorists and how do we need to change in order to become part uh, better as a part of such communication. And how uh, how can we how can that move to uh, lead to changes in the roles of public planners? So it's a great question, Crystal. I think uh, it's, uh, Christian, sorry, and Crystal uh, has a lot of direct experience. Um, I think of, of of doing that kind of work over recent years that uh, that um, I'm I'm sure can answer. I think it's a it's a really profound and important point. Um, I think we need we we can have languages where we have conversations like this with one another, and then we have other kinds of conversations with other kinds of folks. 
um, and I think it's important to be able to distinguish the two. Crystal, did you want to? Yes, thanks, Andy, and thanks, Christian. Uh, lovely to, you know, see you in your written word. Um, Christian visited Melbourne a couple of years ago. Um, I look, I, I, I use methodologies around um, sort of critical participatory action research and sort of quasi ethnographic, uh, where I embed myself in campaigns. And one of the rich opportunities has that has arisen from that work for me um, has been to. Uh, Kind of get checked in occasionally by by people who are working on the streets and are working in these community groups and and kind of challenging the different frameworks upon which I use normative or otherwise um, and certainly the alternative sort of um, sort of traditional kind of Western um, um, planning theories that we've been uh, looking to uh, perhaps don't fit um, so neatly on and with um, wider engagement with um, groups that are really struggling uh, for equitable and just outcomes. And certainly uh, looking towards practices of decolonization. Um, I'm speaking on the Wurundjeri land of the Kulin Nation here today, beautiful country. And this is one of the key challenges that we face both in planning practice and planning theory, I think in the context of which I'm situated in, in Australia is to engage and to hear and to listen in the first instance and to be inspired by the languages that are being used that are are, are are sort of outside our current ways of knowing. Um, I don't know if I've answered the question well, um, but it's 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 what it kind of provoked in me. So thank you, Christian. But I wonder if others have reflections on that question. I, I'm sure we all <laughs> think about um, the languages that we use in planning theory. Okay. Sean, yes, please go. Uh, you are muted. Yeah, I want to ask you a question about you because at the end of your presentation, you said you might introduce Iranian philosophy to, to go beyond the capitalist. Can you explain a little bit more about this and how much or how um, you think this will be beneficial for this change? Because uh, from what I feel here, uh, what I describe about TSP, so it's a strong belief that, that we don't need to follow the Western systems because we are a different country, we, we have different political systems. But sometimes I also feel it's very dangerous to say, I mean, I don't know like how much or how much things we, we always say, okay, we, we have our Confucius and the people always try to put it in the planning. But I feel many of them are actually not fit the modern society so well because I feel like some of our philosophy is discontinued at some point and uh, and uh, as it might be some like very good wisdoms but it's not like uh, the, the western philosophies i always feel it's a good keep going we have a uh, new thinkings new thoughts and still fix the new things and then we are still developing now i mean in different fields for that we're planning so I, i'm just curious about so what's your opinion how how do you think it's beneficial Thanks, Sean, for, for the question. It's, um, I'm working to, to write something about ethical dimension of planning based on the Iranian philosophy. I started working on that. So uh, this is something that I think we, we, can, uh, we can think think about different types of planning, different types of approach to the world, rather than just um, a really limited approach based on the Eurocentric or Western centric philosophy, that is something that is challenging and it's really difficult to explain when you are from different contexts. Looking forward to your new, new articles about this. So I can learn a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, would you like to talk? Um, I can open the you can ask your question. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Askeri. I'm a PhD student at the University of Auckland and under supervision of Ellie and Dr. Lee Bitti. Uh, it was an honor uh, here to uh, be here and hear uh, lots of uh, interesting discussion. Uh, I've got a question, especially following the a uh, very interesting topic that's uh, presented by Andy and Crystal. By the way, uh, other people, if they want to uh, actually respond to my question, it's uh, very welcome. Um, I'm working uh, actually uh, on a kind of 
social inclusion in urban planning. And uh, as a kind of end product of my thesis, I am kind of seeking for uh, providing kind of alternative definition or a kind of alternative narrative of uh, social inclusion in planning. And uh, I think that uh, if I uh, got it right, and the and Crystal, they're doing the same thing, and they're trying to find a kind of alternative, uh, you know, the approach. So my question is that by doing such thing, uh, I mean, uh, or providing kind of alternative narrative or outcome or whatever, uh, aren't we, uh, don't we uh, risk a kind of creating new fantasy? It would be appreciated if, uh, uh, if you guys can uh, respond to me. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Andy, please go ahead. I, I can quickly respond. I, I think my, my answer would be yes. So, uh, but, but by necessity, because uh, if, if we accept that social action is coordinated to some extent by our images of the future, then we have to take seriously the need for images of the future that can coordinate social action differently. If we think we need to coordinate it differently, which I think we do. So it, it should precisely be about creating different types of fantasy. Uh, fantasy is a problem, I mean, is, is a problematic term. It's loaded with different types of theoretical baggage and different traditions of thought and has different types of meaning. So we need to be careful about, about how we use it. But I think we can see it as a, as a proxy or, a, or, or as kind of broadly a synonym to a bunch of other terms that we might that, that, that we might use and may, you might have a preferred term for it. But, but yes, we need images of the future and we need images of better futures to try to stimulate and coordinate action. And I think if we're interested in planning, we need to believe that such images can be powerful and can shape the world. And otherwise, I'm not really sure what's left of an idea of planning. Um, so at, at its root, I would argue, yes, it, it, exactly. Um, so uh, we, we, we need to rethink the, the, the kinds of fantasy and, and narrative or imaginaries uh, that are shaping change and that, that shape policy and that shape action. Um, Ruth Levitas, I don't know if you know her work on a rather slightly old now, probably late 1990s, but she's a great utopian scholar, mm -hmm. did some really good work on social inclusion and exclusion, where she makes kind of similar arguments and I'd really recommend checking that out if you haven't read it before. Cool. Uh, uh, okay, I'm, I think I'm still on mute. Uh, as a follow-up, just uh, I want to know that uh, that that uh, new fantasy, it doesn't uh, harm the people. I mean, that the people who are the subject of planning, uh, how, how can we guarantee that that is not gonna uh, have a kind of uh, more uh, undesirable outcome rather than the uh, kind of prevailing one, a kind of no liberal one or uh, uh, other kind of fantasy that we have at the moment. How we can guarantee that, that our new fantasy is not going to damage more? What? I see Jean's hand was no, up. No, go, 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 Crystal. Okay, thanks, Jean. Appreciate it. Um, look, I, I would just say, in sort of um, building off of what Andy had contributed, was that, you know, in the formation of uh, fantasy in these alternative uh, out, you know, informal spaces, spaces outside of um, formal planning, we might see the construction of a new politics, right? The politicization of planning, sort of these counter hegemonic sort of offerings and opportunities is not to suggest that it's somehow we valorize that, you know, we, we it's to remain sort of critical uh, in that space. But I guess the work that we're doing is looking at how critiquing construction is occurring in these more informal spaces um, so that we can be attuned to how power is made in these spaces and unmade over time uh, and across different geographies. So I think that would be my response to that question. Jean. Thank you. If I can stick my six pennies in, I think for me, it's about, we need fantasies, which is what you and Andy have both said. And, but it's to recognize that this is a new fantasy, to recognize it as a fantasy and to be able to unpick the different elements in that fantasy that I, are rendered invisible, that are tokenized. And so, you know, we do need fantasies. We, we wouldn't have, you know, they underpin our realities in many ways. But what are they missing? What are they concealing? And I think that's what's important. You know, we, we accept them. We, we need them, but we challenge them. We unpick them. Cool. Thank you very much. Th thanks. 
Thank you. I was, I was muted. Um, we have a, another question. Probably you can see all panelists. Um, Ivan asked about the uh, role of fear in the kind of theorizing that Michael discussed. Um, um, I don't think I can't remember anything about fear in the Lacanian uh, work. Yes, please go on, Ivan. Would you like to talk? I can. Please, uh, yes. Okay. Oh, can you hear me? I, I think I'm yes. unmuted. Um, first of all, I want to say um, many thanks for this occasion um, and the opportunity to remember Michael in this way. I found his works very inspiring, uh, but also quite challenging. Uh, it's not my way of thinking. Um, and what I would like to ask about is, is there's this discussion about desire and fantasy are quite positive terms. And I've increasingly, perhaps I'm just getting older, think that fear is quite a key aspect um, of societal discourses and culture and possibly planning too. Um, and I've begun to worry that planning is really about a kind of form of, essentially a form of uh, imposing order because of fear of the other, um, other in terms of racialized groups, working class groups, people who just don't do the garden the way we do the garden. Um, and I wondered whether any of the speakers had been thinking about this, whether this came out from, I don't know Lacan's work, well, it's not something I've dipped into. Um, and uh, I'd be really interested to hear the comments of anybody else uh, around these thoughts. And, and thanks to everybody. May I say something? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ivan, for, uh, for, for the question. Um, uh, regarding to fear, as, as I understand, you know, the, the kind of the discussions, um, it refer to Michael, you know, all the time, um, you know, regarding psychoanalysis, people, they have a fear, you know, um, and uh, especially when they're missing the, the, the big other, you know, and the big other, for Michael used the term, for example, mother, you know, when they have this, that's like a kid, you know, when they are with their mother, and when um, they are fine, but when they, you know, separated from the mother, which is a big other for them, you know, and then it, it's a, become like a fear because they are become incomplete and create a kind of the, uh, uncertainty around them. So most of the discussions about the fear, you know, um, we, we have, you know, in the, especially in the capitalist society, I can say the big other is a market, isn't it? So we want to be, 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 be loved, you know, we want to be, you know, accepted, we want to be with, with others. But most of the time in the capitalist system is to be, you know, accepted in the system. So have a job, you know, get promotion, you know, uh, have a good salary. It's a kind of the things, but we can develop it to the other things as well. The big other can be, you know, your community, even your fun or your family, you know. So um, it depends the, the position, um, but um, but all the time people in the, are in the kind of uncertainty. It's at least my understanding, you know, about the fear that Michael's work. Yes, I, I think two two concepts that are related to Lacanian we, we can explain Lacanian fear is trauma and and uh, the, the traumatic mom, uh, moments that a subject faced the, the lack that is the um, probably the one of the best examples and uh, and and the fantasies uh, the, the point is that fantasies are not always always positive because basically the hegemonic ideology of capitalism um, we know the subject knows that we cannot fix the failures of capitalism so based on this knowledge we create i mean unconsciously we know that the lack is 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 not fully completed we never can feel and fix the failures so um, we we create fantasies but we are aware of this like so that that's why sometimes fantasies are are not that much desirable at at the end um, um i i think i so tan you wanted to hi Eliad. i i was going to Try and offer another um, a, a similar response to yours and Mohan's to Yvonne's fantastic question, but my response is perhaps um, 
<laughs> based on Michael's earlier works around fantasy, and so not 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 the more recent types of works that the works that he's been doing with with um, with with Ellie and and uh, Mohan and with with Jean. And my reading now, I I confess again that I'm not I I don't personally draw on 20th century French philosophers in my own work. Um, but my reading of his earlier work in preparation for today, and I, I would love to hear what others think, and 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 I would love to be um, corrected. But my 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 understanding is that um, that fantasy was the counter to to fear, insecurity. Um, that fantasy is the thing that helps us to get through the day in a world that is really really scary, um, and and that's all very well and good. But when that fantasy then translates in the public domain and becomes something that we all subscribe to, that's that's where um, you know Michael saw saw an issue that an issue that that actually prevents us from thinking beyond the, the fantasies that that organisations subscribe to, or that prevents us from actually critiquing those or moving, you know, asking alternative questions that aren't necessarily that kind of ideology or institutional culture. So that was my reading, but um, I really would love to hear from everyone else in the space if um, if I've got it wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Can I comment this a little? Yeah, thanks for the question, Yvonne. I also think that uh, fear of the other is very important, and but it might be something that is located in the unconscious, I, I believe. So you are not always aware of these fears. Uh, and I think uh, Julia Kristeva, who is also following Lacan, has worked very much on the fear of the other. And also the stranger and the stranger in ourselves that we, we constantly try to project away those fears onto the other. Um, so everything that is unknown or strange, we project on the other. And in order to keep our self pure and our neighborhood pure and things like that. So I think this um, differentiation between inclusion and exclusion, it has very much to do with the fear of the other. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. That was an amazing um, explanation. Just as the last words, I uh, want to thank, thank you all, everyone, um, um, attendees and panelists for um, your contribution, for sharing your audio panelists with us. I really enjoy uh, all the presentations and the question as well. Uh, uh, Michael uh, was um, an influ uh, influential planning theorist. Um, uh, his death is a great loss for all of us, um, specifically in, in, at the University of Auckland in education and, and for us. Uh, but um, his great contribution uh, keeps his legacy alive for uh, forever. Um, and uh, that's it. Uh, thank you again, everyone, and take care. Have a good evening, day, and enjoy the rest of your day or night. <laughs> um, and hope to see you, everyone, soon in person in a free space. <laughs> Also, the peace prisons. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Leon Mosa, for arranging. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs>